Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 321 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and I'm so glad that you are here with me today. Uh, thank you for not minding that I disappeared last week because I disappeared last week. I got sick again. I got sick again. Same thing. It was the bronchial infection, blah, blah, blah. I had been on seven days of antibiotics and I went off and I felt great for three days. And then I got really, really sick again. High fever. Um, fever wouldn't come down, got double antibiotics and then developed an allergy to the antibiotics and covered in a full body rash. And it was just such good times. So basically for two and a half weeks of this month, I just lost to being sick, which was difficult uh, because not only was it tax time for the States and for New Zealand, and I know that sounds confusing to you, but because they are combined and New Zealand has different um, tax times and it, it uh, there was just a lot to do tax wise and also um, class wise. Uh, my classes were winding up all three classes were winding up and all of my focus and energy for when I was sitting up was going into doing that, what I absolutely had to do. And it wasn't until Friday or Saturday when I was lying in bed feverish again, still thinking, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't do a podcast and I don't care. I couldn't get out of bed to do one. So in order to make that up to you, I'm feeling much better now. Thank you for asking. I'm going to do a mini podcast and catch up on a bunch of questions that I have fallen behind in. So as you know, you can join my Patreon level at the $5 a month or up level and ask me any questions that you want. And honestly, you guys, this is such a bargain. Patreon.com slash Rachel. There's my push for it. Let's get into the questions because they are great ones. All right. Catherine says, hi, Rachel. I'm in the process of getting my first book, a travel memoir edited. In a previous episode, you said an editor is like a masterclass. I 100% agree. I'm learning so much for this and future books. I followed your memoir process and was thrilled when my editor came back saying how impressed she was with the structure since I'm a first time writer. All credit to you, Rachel. No, that's all credit to you, Catherine, but thank you for saying that. Uh, my first question is about back cover blurbs. I'm going round in circles, writing and rewriting. It's been a fun process trying to get the voice of the book into the blurb. I'm finding the blurb is a really intense effort to draw readers in like a movie trailer, but my frustration levels are creeping up. What tips do you have? Uh, one other question. I've loved this whole process so much. I'm thinking of writing a novel. I loved your fast draft, your memoir. How can I adapt it to write a novel? Thanks so much. Okay, so first question about writing the blurb. So. Um, Blurb can be used in two different ways. Blurb is what we talk about on the back of a book that hooks your reader and makes them want to buy the book, or it's the little um, uh, excerpt, you know, it's the little description that you see on Amazon or in, any of the e-vendors that talks about the book. Or sometimes we say blurbs when we are asking other authors for quotes about our book. So in this case, we are talking about blurbs as the hook, the grabby thing that makes somebody want to read it. So my first tip is always to write a terrible draft or two or three of it. Uh, you want to keep it short and sweet. Um, people have shown that shorter paragraphs are better than longer paragraphs. You're going to keep the eyeballs moving, keep them. We want to keep the pacing of this up, even though it's very, very short. Um, and so do some crappy, crappy first drafts, play around with pacing, spacing, how many words in a paragraph, um, how many paragraphs do you want two or three, um, four, maybe there's no, there's no rules, but, um, I like to keep mine at, I like to keep the story part of my book at two or three paragraphs max. Um, I have been redoing my blurbs. So you could look at the first three books in the Cypress Hollow series are where I'm up to um, optimizing at this point, but those I am doing the best I can with grabbing a reader, grabbing a reader's attention with that above the fold blurb um, so that they have to push the more button to read more about the book on Amazon. That's where I've been playing with it. So if you look at um, Cypress Hollow One, which is called Abigail's Shop, you can see how I did that there. I'm not saying that it is a perfect blurb, uh, but I've definitely been working at crafting that with the knowledge that I have learned over the years. Uh, the number two thing that I like to do is I like, we just forget about telling the story. We don't want to tell the story in a blurb. We want to give the flavor and get the reader's curiosity peaked. So a lot of times what that looks like is just telling the reader about what happens in the book up until the inciting incident, up until that big change is presented to our main character. And then we get to say, what will happen when X, Y, and Z. We absolutely don't want to introduce plot threads 
Um, we don't need to have last names. We don't, we definitely don't want to have, uh, you're not going to have this in, in memoir, but like world building stuff, like the name of the planet and the name of the spaceship, every single name that is unfamiliar to a reader is a slight push away. We want to keep them in. We want to bring them in, make them think that they know this character already and have empathy for this character. And suddenly this character is faced with something. How will they handle that something? That is all a blurb needs to do. The reader will actually forget what the blurb said. The blurb is to get the reader to buy the book and start reading it. That's all it is. So if I can, that's my biggest tip is to let go of trying to tell what your book is about. That is not a blurb's job. A blurb's job is copywriting to sell. It is marketing for your book and it is hard. So the reason you're struggling with it is that it is hard. Uh, get other eyeballs on it. That's my last tip. Get as many eyeballs as on it as you can. Uh, friends, beta readers, other writers, um, people on Facebook, get them to look at it and give you advice. Are you in my Onward Slack writer group. The link to join it is always in the show notes. Um, throw it in there. Let's, let's help you workshop it. Uh, so yes, that is what I would say. And very exciting. Um, number two, your second question about how can I adapt it to write a novel? Fast draft your memoir. The story structure in that is for novels. It is the same exact thing. You could use everything in fast draft your memoir to write a novel. We're still talking about inciting incident, context shifting midpoint, dark moment. We're still talking about, um, character development and character growth, character change, and how that is related to and woven into the theme of the book. All of that is the same. However, I will add that I am committed to, in the next three months, um, trying to, not trying to, I'm committed to finishing 90 Days to Done, which is my um, masterclass that I teach, but I'm also writing the book of it. And I'm also really trying to film an evergreen course, which would be half the price of the VIP masterclass um, in which you work with me. The evergreen course would be taking you through it. So um, there would be the book, evergreen and the masterclass. So that will have all of my ideas about writing novels. And also all of that information in 90 Days of Done will apply to memoir because memoir and novels are structured the same. So you already know all this stuff, Catherine. And I'm so happy about what your developmental editor said. I think that is so cool. Thank you for telling me. And I think you're amazing. Okay. Um, these questions come from Penn and they are about uh, translations for fiction. Okay. And Penn says, when in the scheme of building series slash platform slash backlist slash readership, would you consider fiction translations? What are the elements you recommend authors consider in the deliberation? What process do you recommend? Rights to publisher versus private contracts with other versus others. And what are the ducks that need to be in a row to make it worthwhile, lower stress? Any other thoughts? Um, I do have thoughts. They are not, they are not, um, I am not a professional on this. I'm not going to be able to give you a ton of information on this because I have done some translation and I have then run away in fear and agony. Um, but the main thing to consider is whether your genre sells in translation. So if you are writing straight romance and you are considering translating to German, what does the German market look like for straight contemporary romance? If that is selling well, then that is your, that's your biggest consideration. Um, if, and Penn, I know that you write queer romance. So I would check to see how queer indie published romance is selling in Germany or France or Italy or wherever you are thinking about translating to. And if it's not selling well, I do not recommend that you are the one to push that envelope um, to break into that market. Of course, there will be somebody that breaks in and says, I'm so glad I'm the one who broke the seal and broke into this market. And now the floodgates are open and I'm the one who made the most money. Uh, but the problem is, is that getting translations done is so expensive normally that that is not the best way to go. In so consider genre first. Research whether your genre is selling well in translation in the market in which you are considering going into. Um, markets that are hot for romance include Germany, Italy, Spain, France, um, those are the those are the big ones that I know of. I have had translations into French, German, Italian, Polish, and that's all for my fiction. Um, those were all either done by my publisher 
or by um, selling the rights to another publishing company who then does the translations. And I will tell you just straight up, honestly, I don't make money on those. Um, what happens is that I usually get, you know, two or $3,000 for selling the rights to whatever um, translation company or publisher is offering them. And then I never see another dime. So it's great for me. It's free money. They're saying it's just money for this book I've already written. I would see money if they sold well, if I earned out against that, it was because it's an advance. If I earned out, say, say they gave me $3,000. If I earned out that advance of $3,000 and sold more copies, then I would suddenly start making money. And I never have. Is that true? That is true. I have never, ever gotten a royalty payment from France, Germany, Italy, or Poland. There's another country in there and I can't remember what it is. Um, another translation. I will look it up. But never seen another dime. Um, I have done one nonfiction book. I did Fast Draft Your Memoir in German and <laughs> it does not sell. Does not sell. Absolutely. I think we might sell one copy every two months. I am not exaggerating. Maybe one copy a month. So in terms of nonfiction about writing, the German market is not quite there yet. Um, other things that you have to, for, for me, for what I know, which is not a lot, but that's, um, that's my experience. The, you also have to know the different laws in the different countries. Like for example, in Germany, your translator gets copyright, uh, gets copyright on your book. You share copyright. So now when you, ha you had 100% copyright, I think it's 50-50, I might be wrong about that, but, but do check those rules. So if your German translator is in Germany and a German national, they get copyright. So then um, whatever you make on that book must be split with them forever. It's like a royalty share forever. There are ways around that. Um, you can hire people outside of Germany to do that, but you need to make sure you understand their nationality. I am not giving legal advice here. I do not know all the ins and outs of it, um, but that's just to tell you how complicated it can be. Uh, so make sure that you understand the rules around that. Therefore, for me, um, your question about, um, do you recommend rights to publisher or private contracts, like hiring and doing it yourself, like I did with Fast Draft Your Memoir. Um, I prefer rights to publisher because they give you an advance and then you don't think about it again and say it does really well. Yay. You're going to make money. Say it doesn't do well. Yay. You made $2,000 or whatever it was. Uh, that is what I prefer. And that is not what a lot of wildly successful indie publishers prefer. There are wildly successful indie publishers who are making money by doing the translations, um, hiring the translations, uploading them themselves, um, making sure that they get the, the marketing material so that they can run ads with the correct language, um, that kind of thing, getting all of that in place. And I am not one of those. So I'm not the most helpful for this, but this is how I feel about that. Now I am willing to change on a dime. As soon as I learn that somebody is doing something that is working, I, I'll always do it. You know that. So uh, Penn, keep me posted on what you decide on this. I think this is fascinating and awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next question. Um, do, do, do This comes from Mariah. Mariah says, since my last message, I have decided to move on a work on a new project until I can sort out how I want to deal with the old one. It's going really well, and I'm sure I won't try to look back until it is done. My next question, when you are writing a thriller, mystery, or drama, how do you work in the plot twist so that it is surprising and satisfying to readers? I'm worried I'll either not give enough foreshadowing, and if I rip the rug out from under the reader, they'll be annoyed. Or I'm worried I'll give away too much in the beginning and it'll fall flat. Is this something you focus on more in your first drafts or the subsequent ones? When I read Thriller, I live for the plot twist, whether I figured it out on page one or it takes me by surprise. I want to give my future readers the same magic I get when I read, but how do I do that? I recently read Hush Little Baby and immediately had to come back and ask you how you do it. I had my guesses about who the villain was, but I was thrown off course a few times and I doubted it until it was revealed. That's what I want to be able to do, but I feel like you have to be extremely clever to do it well, or you have to be taught. So please do teach. Oh, Mariah, what a lovely, lovely question. And um, I, I think I've mentioned before, and I'll mention again that Hush Little Baby was 
it was such, it was so hard. It was, it was so hard because I, I sold a, I sold on proposal. I hadn't written the book yet, which means I'd written a synopsis of a book I hadn't written. And I'd written the synopsis well, because I'm a good writer. And I, in that synopsis, I convinced my agent and my editor who bought the book that I'd be able to pull off what I said I was going to pull off. And none of us saw the, the gaping plot holes that were in that synopsis because I'm a good writer. And I disguised them because I think in the back of my head, I didn't know this consciously, but subconsciously, I was definitely saying, I'll be able to do that. I can do that. When I get there, I'll write that. I'll figure it out. I could not figure it out. And the first draft, uh, I think I got to about 75% of that book written of the first draft. And I realized that the first 50% of the book needed to be thrown out because basically the bad guy had an, a red neon arrow over their head from chapter two. And there was absolutely no surprise. There was no twist. There was no, there was nothing because I had killed it dead. Uh, so I did what I normally do. I write up to the dark moment and then I started all over again and I ripped the book apart and I put it back together knowing that I had to disguise this person better. I went into that book knowing who the bad guy was. Um, however, there's a twist in that book that, and this is the most important part. So I've, I've only written two thrillers, but I've, I guess I've written a couple of other um, romantic suspense. Yeah, two or three other romantic sus suspense. They're not called that, but there is suspense, crime, thriller elements in them. And what always, always, always happens for me is that I think I know the twist. And then when I'm writing, a better twist comes. And that is how I know it's going to shock the reader because I don't know it until I get there. And I think... I can't do that. That can't happen. And usually when I have the, that can't happen, I can't write that. Um, and honestly, that usually comes in like a second draft. That's the real twist. I you normally keep the first twist. That was the, the surprise about who did it or whatever it was. But, but the real twist is something that comes later in the book that I did not see coming. And if you don't see it coming as a writer, as you are writing a crappy first draft, um, your reader will not see it coming either. So my Short answer to your excellent question is, this is something we ne almost never do in a first draft. It is always something that is layered in later in revision. We do a very bad job and we allow ourselves and we are comfortable with the fact that we're doing a very, 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 very bad job in the first draft and often in the second draft. And then in subsequent drafts and passes, we smooth it out. We figure out how to do this. Um, regarding your question about uh, ripping the rug out from under the reader, readers want the rug ripped out. Unless, like, so so say you didn't foreshadow it very much and then you rip the, the rug out. If it doesn't make sense logically, of course, they're going to be mad. But if it makes sense logically and they never had a hint of a foreshadow, ooh, they love that the best of all. So don't worry about that one. Do worry about foreshadowing too much, but do not worry about foreshadowing too much until you're like in that second or third revision. That is when you start worrying about it and you will get it wrong. And your editor, whoever you're working with will have to help you because in crime fiction, that's one of the hardest things to pull off. And we think we do a good job. We, we do as good a job as we can. And then editors say, no, saw it coming over here or wow, you're heavy handed here or what the heck, what the hell is over here? That's what the editor's job is for, but don't try to do this right. Um, don't try to plan it out too much in the beginning. Uh, you do not have to be clever to do it well. You have to be stubborn and willing to sit with the discomfort of writing terrible first and second drafts and working it out as you go through there. You don't have to be clever at all. Um, allow yourself to be surprised as you're writing and layer in all the beautiful, wonderful foreshadowing clues, red herrings later or fix fix what you broke later. Uh, so that's a, that's a nice, that's a nice gift to give yourself. So, oh, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that. Thank you for that beautiful question. Um, let's see. I think this is the last question. Emma Jane, Emma Jane, thank you for being patient. I know you sent this question in so long ago. Um, okay. Hi, Rachel. I want to start by thanking you for your podcast. Your message is to be kind to yourself and hearing so many different processes has helped me so much in a year that has been very tough and not left much room for writing. Uh, you're welcome. I've been learning and been inspired. So it's not felt like my writing has been totally neglected. Yay. Writing time will become a thing again very soon. Exciting. But I am a little tentative to get stuck back in. I'm wondering if you can help. I'm revising, not my favorite part, and I'm a plotter. 
In theory, my plotting should mean the revision isn't a massive rewrite. However, somehow I've ended up with a huge cliche of a villain and I'm not happy with it. I've done a lot of thinking and my plan to resolve it requires a lot of cutting and a lot of new scenes, possibly in another point of view. My worry is that doing that work is pointless and I might be able to just fix what I have. It is a witchy ghost story taking place over two timelines. Um, da, 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 da. I think I don't need to read all of the details out um, because my answer will be the same. Um, my fix involves using some of the ghost stuff I've already established. Um, da, da, da. I think my fix ties in with my theme because Constance's fix is to try and magic her way out of it instead of facing up to her past, but is it necessary? I've done a massive rewrite on a previous novel and wasn't happy with the result. So I'm scared I'm letting my imagination get carried away and come up with an alternate story when what I have is fine. How do I know what to do? Thank you so much for your time. Looking forward for the next, how do you write? So I just, I skipped over the details even though I, I had already read them. Um, I'm going to say to you, you can trust your gut on this. I think your fix sounds great. I think it sounds like it will work. And you're asking me this question because it is important enough to ask about. Your first draft taught you about this book. And no matter how much we plot, we can be the best plotter in the entire world. Revision will always, almost always require taking the book apart, like cutting into pieces, moving things around and doing a lot more first drafting, um, getting rid of stuff that we thought we loved, we, that we thought would work, but actually doesn't. Um, that's what revision always entails, even if you are a perfect plotter. It just does. That's, that's how it works. Your book has taught you already so much about what it wants to be. And the fact that your brain is giving you this fix that will make it stronger means that you understand it more and means that you know, you can be sure that you are, you know, that you're doing the right thing. You're not going to break your book. You have this idea um, because it is meant to be, right? And, and because you know what you're doing, because your book is actually telling you how it can be better. And yes, we shy away from that. And you shy away from it because as you said, you've done a massive rewrite on a previous novel and wasn't happy with the result. Um, and it is possible that that was a book that you were learning on and now you really know what you're doing. Um, also possible that that book, um, if it is not done or is not published, that it might require another massive rewrite. And many of, most of my books require at least two massive pulling aparts and then putting back together. Uh, and it isn't, it isn't, it isn't the most fun, especially for a person who doesn't love revision, um, which is most of us until that one day where we look across the dining table at revision in the candlelight and they look so beautiful and we fall in love with them. They've been there all along. And then, and then now they're the, they're the sexiest thing you've ever seen uh, that might happen in your future. And it might not, and that's okay if it doesn't. I don't think you are letting your imagination get carried away with you. Um, you are, it doesn't sound like you're in danger of that trap that we sometimes fall into, which is uh, not wanting to finish the book or being so concerned about getting it right that we are introducing new problems just to um, make ourselves feel better. You're not doing that. You have thought of a good, you have noticed things that are jumping out at you. They will jump out at editors. They will jump out at readers. And your brain is also assisting you with the fix. Um, and you've already done it's not going to be as heavy lifting as you think. That's the nice thing about being a plotter is that when you are doing the rewrite, yes, these are massive things. You're going to have to pull the book apart and put it together, but you really know already how it works. And it won't be as much work as you think. It just requires you to think about all of the pieces, make a plan for all of those pieces, and then go execute the plan in the next revision that you work through from beginning to end. Um, and you can do it. I know, I absolutely know that you can do it. You can trust your gut. Um, you understand this stuff and your book is helping you. And that sounds woo-woo, but I mean it. So um, thank you for asking that. Thank you everyone for asking these awesome questions. These were super fun to answer. And I'm um, very glad to be in your earballs again. Uh, I will be going on vacation next week. So I'm hoping to get a bunch of um, podcasts uploaded, but maybe there will be a missing week. You never know.
depends on how today goes because it's a busy week and I'm not trying to exhaust myself today. So I'm going to wish you all very, very happy writing. And hey, if you want to join the Patreon level, the $5 a month level, you can send me any of your questions too. And then I will probably delay getting them to you until you're really frustrated and wishing that I would do the podcast episode already. And then I do. And I hope that it is, it was worth the wait. So thanks everybody. And send me new questions. I'm out of questions. Okay, everybody. Happy writing.